All right, Jennifer, I think we are live. I am here and good to go. Excellent. All right, yep, I am um, watching on my phone to make sure that everything is fine. Uh, let's get some thumbs up from people that they can hear us and see us. So I'm looking for some thumbs up and some hearts or some comments, letting us know that everything is going good. All right, I've got some thumbs up. I've got a thumbs up, all three thumbs up here. So I think we are good to go. Okay, now they're flowing in, tons of thumbs ups coming in now. So I think we are good to go. So we are um, very excited to have Jen doing the leading of uh, this Facebook Live. And we're gonna talk about crosses, front cross, rear cross, blind cross, and which one is best. So um, last night we did a live where we talked about lines and uh, did a coach's eye analysis. And then today we've got um, Jennifer, do, and she's going to also do a coach's eye analysis to talk about these crosses. Um, let's see, just making sure that we are good on the video. All right, I'm seeing all of the thumbs up. Okay, so uh, Jennifer, I think, uh, we are ready for you to take it away. And awesome. Talk about your runs with uh, Pink and Lucky. Okay. So uh, what we're going to take a review of is exactly as Sarah said, looking at front cross, blind cross, uh, rear cross, which one where, why to make the decision, what are the rules for when I would choose one versus the other. And I thought it would be a really good idea to take a course that I ran with multiple dogs and but ran differently and talk a little bit about why I did them different. So why I did one cross with one dog uh, versus another. So some of you may be running multiple dogs that need to be different. Others of you may be only running one, but trying to make the decision, well, when do I front versus when do I blind or when do I front versus when do I rear? So what we're gonna take a look at in Coach's Eye is two runs from this year's Westminster Jumpers course. All right. So I'm gonna pull those up on Coach's Eye for you guys real quick. All right, so while Jennifer's doing that, we just want to let y'all know that um, you can absolutely ask questions. If you uh, want Jennifer to clarify something or if you have an additional question about what she's talking about, just let us know right here in the comments. And, um, and we will circle back uh, and answer those questions uh, right after she does her analysis and before Esteban does his analysis. So, all right, we've got the coach's eye up, and I'm going to go ahead and uh, mute myself and stop my video. Okay. So, uh, what we're going to do since we're doing a review of the two runs is we're going to actually take a look not only at coach's eye, but using a very cool feature of uh, the side-by-side. -side. So, on the left-hand screen over here, you are going to see pink. On the right-hand screen over here, you are going to see lucky. So pink is my 16 inch jumping border collie, lucky being my 16 inch jumping Sheltie. And they are very different in how they run. Uh, both, you know, have a lot of the same training and a lot of the same skills, uh, but different speeds and naturally uh, different dogs. So pink, very driven, uh, very much wants to go fast. A lot of times what we consider a little bit more obstacle focus, lucky, very tight turner, very willing to turn, very willing to respond to the cues and needs a little bit more gas. So I think of uh, pinks like driving the Ferrari, got to be very careful, very gentle on the gas. Lucky can use a little bit more and I can do a lot more pushing. So we're going to look at the jumpers course from Westminster and we're just going to be starting on the section out of the weave poles. All right, so I've gone ahead and fast forwarded both two coming right out of the weave poles. And we're gonna go ahead and take a look at Lucky who is on the right side and what I choose to do with him first. So coming out of the weave poles with both dogs, I did a front cross here to release and open up to, as you can see, jump number five. And this is gonna be the first difference on how I chose to handle them. So with Lucky, after completing the front cross out of the weave poles, I choose to do a forward send. So I'm just using deceleration to cue the turn and then keeping him on my right. I simply choose to do this line as a pull all dog on right down the line. You can see he does drop the bar there. We're going to try to ignore that and not take a look at the bar, but more the handling to come over the wing long jump on my right into this wing here. And then with him, I choose to come in and do a blind cross. So to pick him up on my left, to go over this wing. 
Okay, so one of the things that we're going to look at and why I chose to handle the section out of the weeds and the jump out of the weeds is taking a look at all the way downstream on 8, 9, 10. So a lot of people get caught up on what's happening at the moment. So in this case, what was jump five? So if we go back up to the weave poles, just taking a look at what is going to best cue the turn at jump five. But we really have to look big picture. We have to say what's coming downstream? Where do I need to be? Uh, generally speaking, if your dog is faster than you, you want to try to be on the inside of the curve. Okay, if you're going to run on the outside of the curve, you need to be able to outrun your dog. You need to be able to be ahead of your dog at the point because you are running additional yardage, but also because of the lead that the dog is going to be on. So it was a small curve from six, seven, eight. If we go forward again, you will notice that that is a curve, what would be clockwise relative to the dog. So a bend to the right off of the long jump. I was on the outside of the curve, I needed to be ahead. And I knew with Lucky that I could do the turn out of the weave poles as a forward send, all dog on right and outrun them here. So now let's go ahead and come over and take a look at Pink and why I chose the differences with her. So because she's a little bit faster, I did not think I was gonna be able to do all dog on right. So I wanted to come over and be on the inside of the curve. So I wanted to be over here on this side coming down the line because if I am on her right at the long jump, she's going to be on the right lead, which will help grab this jump. If I am on her left, her natural tendency then would be to curl to the left after the broad jump, which now risks the possibility of not getting this jump. So because of that line, I wanted to have her on the other side, but even taking one more look at that, I wanted to see if there was any way to give me a chance to get ahead. So I go ahead and choose to do a send into a blind cross on number five. So if we take a look at that uh, send here, I do the front cross out of the weave poles. I do the front cross out of the weave poles and I send to this jump, but I actually rotate away from her and then pick her up for the blind cross to head downstream. Now, when we take a look at crosses, one thing about blind crosses is in this situation, we're doing a blind cross with a rotation away from her. A shoulder rotation away from the dog is a forward cue. So when you watch her turn, you will see she does not turn particularly tight. There's not a lot telling her to turn, and I'm fully aware of that. I did bank quite a bit on the fact that this was just the perimeter around here, there was no off courses that she could take. So she went a little bit wide. So if we go back and we just look at the turn there at jump five, and we go back and look at the difference in her path versus Lucky's, who I just did the deceleration and the forward send, you're going to see at this point, he's coming around that wing much tighter than she is. She's way out here behind me. You can see she actually ends up for a moment almost on my right side. So the difference in the turns here, I'm very aware that the blind cross did not cue as tight of a turn, but made that choice to use that wide turn to get me ahead. So forward send with a pull with Lucky gave me a tighter turn, but I was in more of a foot race. Here doing the blind cross with the shoulder rotation away, which is a forward cue, got me a wider turn. Had there been an off course out here, definitely could have potentially been in trouble. So if we look at how that now affects us downstream, just zooming out a little bit there. So you can see I get a head start on her and I stay on the inside of the curve here. So as she comes over the broad, you can see how she's already bending to the right. That's because I'm on her right. I'm on the inside of the curve. Okay. If I had been on the other side, she would have been coming over on the left lead and I potentially would not have made that push out to that jump. So now that gives me two different choices on this next 180 into the tunnel with pink on my left and me now falling behind, I had no choice but what was going to be not only one rear, but a double rear. So with her, I go into a rear cross here, switch her on to the left lead as she's jumping here, which then forced for another rear cross at jump number nine and back to the tunnel. Okay, so some people on this did elect to do a landing side rear cross on nine, which I knew was going to risk a wide turn. So I went ahead and did the takeoff side rear. So in the case of pink, I had to do the double rears because I didn't have any other option. So if we go back to this section with Lucky and we take a look at what I did with him, you can see I was ahead. So look at the difference in where I am on the broad jump with him compared to pink. So because I was ahead and we're looking at a relatively soft curve, I went ahead and did the blind cross. So once he landed off of the long jump, 
I cued the next wing on my right, saw that he was mentally committed and went ahead and went into the blind. So you can see I'm turning back over my left shoulder and bringing up my left hand before he physically takes off. By the time he lands, I'm right there to grab his head and pick him up for the next jump. So when deciding to do fronts versus blinds, and we're gonna talk a little bit about this at jump 12, uh, but I'm gonna use this opportunity here. We wanna look at the degree of turn, all right? The sharper the turn, the more acute the angle, the more likely I'm going to be to do a front cross. The softer the turn, the more likely I'm going to be to do a blind. So if we draw our angles, go back to all that geometry from years ago, the turn from the broad jump to the wing, and then from the 180 from here to here, okay, you can't see that next jump, is a relatively obtuse line. So again, if we go back to geometry, 90 degrees, all right, anything less than 90 degrees is considered acute, anything greater is considered obtuse. So the reason I chose to do a blind versus a front is because it's a relatively soft turn on that jump. If we would have been coming from, you know, say an obstacle over here, and now the line came in here, and then we turned off to this because of the nature of the tighter turn and therefore more shift onto the rear and more collection needed, I would have wanted to give additional turning cues. And as we previously mentioned, the shoulder rotation away is a forward cue, shoulder rotation towards the dog is a turning cue. So I would have opted to go in for the front cross. Okay, so pink, I had no choice but to do the rear cross. Lucky, I was ahead. I had a choice between a front and a blind and went for the blind because of the more obtuse line. And that angle, guys, that degree of turn is going to be something that you need to figure out for your dog. Every dog is going to be a little bit different in terms of what that tipping point is. Turns that I might be able to do a blind cross with Lucky, I'm not going to be able to do with pink or swift. Her degree of turn, her tipping point as to front versus blind is going to be much more uh, significant. So if we go ahead now and scroll ahead to the next uh, turn that we're going to look at, which is 11-12. So let's again, we'll go ahead and look at Lucky here. We go around into the tunnel. Both dogs I do a blind cross out of the tunnel. What we're looking at is the turn here on 11-12. So if we go ahead and play this, you're going to see that we're looking for about a 90 degree turn as the dogs come over. We're going to be cutting back in this direction for those of you that aren't familiar with the course. So I have him on my right, Q jump 11. Once I know he's headed to 12, so I Q 12 on my right, we're going to go into a blind cross here to pick him up for jump number 13. Now again, the question may be why a blind versus a front? If you're ahead, you could do either, and I could. I could have easily done a front versus a blind, but we're back to that degree of turn. How many forward cues did I need? How much collection did I need at 12 versus what my turning cues could have been? So if we draw the line 11 to 12 here, all right, draw the line 12 to 13. You guys should be real familiar with your lines based on last night's uh, Facebook Live with Esteban. You can see that for Lucky, this is a soft enough turn that again, I can give the forward cues and go ahead and do the blind. So I can give the rotation away. So this part right here, okay, we kind of lose him. Let's see if I can uh, zoom out a little bit on him and come in. Let's go back to his jumping effort. I can cue the extension. I can cue the at, uh, longer stride. He does not add in a stride there at 12, which is perfect for his turn to 13. Now a large dog, a higher drive dog with a longer, longer stride, if they did not add that stride in there, which he does not do, they potentially could be pulling this jump into play or their turn could go wider and they would have to cut back. But for him, based on his drive, his stride length, I knew I could give those forward cues. So now if we hop over to pink, same thing, I do the blind cross coming out of the tunnel. I'm going to zoom in a little bit. You will notice with her, I'm also ahead. All right, so I'm ahead at number 11. She's jumping. I'm about halfway up to 12, but you'll see... I decide with her to go into the front cross to then open up to the next jump. And the reason being is for very similar to the reasons we just talked about with Lucky. If I had rotated away, that is a forward cue and I would have risked her going long. With the front cross, if you can see, I already am bringing up right there. Oops, where's my little circle? There we go. Right there, I'm bringing up the outside arm and I am beginning that shoulder rotation back towards her as soon as I know I have commitment to the extension on 11. So she's jumping 11, she's committed. I wanna give her those turning cues as early as possible. If I was doing the blind, I would not be able to begin the blind until after she lands off of 11 and I know I have mental commitment to 12. 
So I would still be facing forward. I would still be on an inside arm. These are all forward cues. These are all going to cause her to want to go long. But with the front, I choose to do the shoulder rotation so you can see right there, rotating towards or bringing up the outside arm to help give the turning cues for 12 and then over onto 13. So I think a big misconception is that uh, people think, oh, I can't get there for the front cross, so I will do the blind cross. And I will be the first to tell you, if you can't make it for the front, then you're not going to want to do a blind. If you can't make it up there for the front cross, then you're not far enough ahead to do the blind. Because as I just mentioned, I actually had to start that front cross a little bit earlier with pink than I would have had to do that same blind cross. So it actually required me to be up there starting my rotation and turning. The one thing we do consistently see and talk about and I hear from students is the difference on the physical effort of the front cross versus the blind cross. So if we take one more look at this and we don't look at the dog, we don't look at the, the turning cues or, or I'm sorry, we don't look at the jumping effort and the added strides, we just look at the physical ease on the handler. You will see that here with Lucky, it's much easier on me physically to just turn my head and switch up the other arm. No twisting, no turning, no rotation, no risk of that discombobulation. Where if we come through here and we watch my mechanics and my physical effort, I'm already turning my upper body, but trying to keep my lower body forward. So we are talking about a little bit of twisting with the core and strength there, pivoting and rotating. And then there we got the plant plant and you can see twisting to open up. Now, you know, once I open up, you'll see me right there, glance ahead to ensure that I am opening up to the correct jump, trying to stay very spatially aware. But there are going to be a large percentage of you guys out there who will need the blind cross for the physical ease on your body. All right. I see this a lot. People that a lot of times with smaller dogs, they're looking down and they'll get discombobulated out of a front or they've had past knee surgeries or injuries and they need to minimize the rotation on your part. So if I have a choice between a front or a blind, and in this case with pink, I did not have as much of a choice with lucky. I did have a choice. I will try to do the front because it gives me a few more turning cues. Okay. But if a scenario is there where I'm not going to be far enough ahead, I will go in for the front. If I need the forward cues, I'm going to go into the blind. All right, so it's nice to have both options, but we do understand limitations come into play. So with the blinds, if you know you have some physical limitations and the uh, rotation away is physically easier on you, I will say that the more you do with the dogs, the more they will pick up on that. But there is still going to be some degree of turn at which point it's going to be too sharp for the dog to read in a proactive manner. They might jump long and then have to reactively cut back. Um, and you'll still get it done, but you're not really being fair to the dog in terms of giving them that information. Sometimes you'll risk a bar if you're trying to cue too tight of a turn with a rotation away that gave those forward cues. All right. So on these courses, the reason I chose these two courses with these two dogs is to talk about the differences in dogs. Uh, but also we covered all three crosses. We looked at the rear cross. We looked at the blind cross. We looked at the front cross. Um, and in all three parts, so the turn out of the weaf poles the 180 before the tunnel, and this last turn right here after the panel from 12 to 13. And all three of those parts, I did the dogs a little bit differently for different reasons. So I kind of wanted to walk you guys through um, a little bit more, not so much on the how, not so much on how to do a front or how to do a rear, as much as the why I chose one versus the other, the strategy, the why, the where, the when, uh, more on why I chose one versus the other, why you might choose one versus another. So based on that, Sarah, are we getting any questions coming in with regard to those three sections or uh, some questions about why I chose one option versus another for one dog over another? Uh, not really any questions. One thing I want to mention, Jen, is to go ahead and mute um, when I'm talking and when you're not, and I'll do the same. Uh, uh, one person, at least, was saying they were hearing an echo. Um, so we'll just do that real quick. Uh, the only thing that was really mentioned, that now is your chance, everybody, to ask your questions, is uh, Monica mentioned, it looks like you use blinds when you're ahead more. Yes, that is absolutely correct. You have to be further ahead to do a blind than you have to be to do a front. And that was a big part of it with pink. Um, on that line from tunnel, uh, double panel to the turn, while I was ahead, I was not far enough ahead 
to appropriately cue the blind at 12, nor did I feel like the degree of turn was appropriate to do a blind cross for her. So I kind of really had two factors there. Um, even if I had been further ahead, so say she got caught up in the tunnel or it was a longer tunnel or for whatever reason I was further ahead, that turn, if you were to look at the course map, is about a 90 degree turn. Um, I, I think you guys can still see my screen here, so I'm going to go over um, and let me see if I can remove this and make pinks bigger. So I think you guys are now just seeing pinks run, just trying to make that screen a little bit bigger for you. So from 11 to 12, we've got a straight line there. She should be jumping over the left edge. And then from uh, 12 to 13, you're looking at a straight line there. That's almost a 90 degree turn. That is enough of a turn for pink that I did not want her jumping 12 in full extension. So we really had two factors there. One, yes, you need to be further ahead to do the blind. I did not feel like I was with her that I had with Lucky. But also each dog, you need to find the degree of turn that's going to be appropriate for those amount of forward cues. I can tell you that for Lucky, it is about 90 degrees is the tipping point. Anywhere between 90 to 110 degrees, I'm really going to question, should I front, should I blind? Anything that's a softer turn than that or a more obtuse turn than that, I'm definitely going to look at a blind cross. For pink, it almost always has to be a much softer turn, a much more obtuse turn. I would say the minimum for her that I would do a blind cross on would probably be about something about a 135 degree turn if I'm looking to appropriately cue the turn. Now, again, if we go back to the scenario after the weave pulse, this was obviously a much sharper turn here. So we were coming out of the weave poles and going to that jump only to then turn around and come right back around the wing. So very sharp turn. I know when I did that blind, it was not going to be the best option for cueing the turn. I took advantage of actually both the ring gating, so the possibility of no off courses, combined with the fact that if she went a little wide, it gave me more of a chance to get a head start and come down this line, which very much happens. As you can see, she drifts out wide there, gives me a chance to help get downstream. So that's going to be a factor for you guys in deciding crosses. Don't just get isolated on that one spot, but actually look big picture. Where are you coming from? How can you be ahead or are you going to be behind? So where are you going to be relative to your dog based on the preceding obstacles, but also where are you going? What do you need to be doing downstream? Is it just the pause table next and you can be behind and get caught up? Or do you have a long technical run like we have here needing to be downstream to keep out of the tunnel. Next question here is from Joyce. I believe this is um, our Joyce that lent us her video last night. It's a, and she asked, what makes you decide takeoff or landing side for the rear cross? That's an excellent question. Very, very good one. So a takeoff side rear cross is going to cue the turn and lead change prior to the jump. A rear cross on the flat is not going to cue the lead change or uh, the turn until after the dog jumps. So if we fast forward, I think the part I mentioned about the two rear crosses is right here. So if we look at jump nine, you will see that because I apply pressure towards her before commitment, so right here I'm pressuring in, she jumps on the right lead and lands already turned. If we go back and say, okay, well, what would have happened if we did a rear cross on the landing? So in order to do a rear cross on the landing, instead of pushing in at this point and having the dog turn, I would have been proceeding forward here. And so pink would have proceeded forward. All right, now dogs will choose to be on the lead of the side you're on if not otherwise cued. So if I stayed straight on her left lead, she would have taken this on her left lead. She would not have in any way been prepared for a turn to the right. So when she landed, and let's ignore where the dog is, I'm zooming over so you can see the space, what would have happened is I would have still been out here, she would have still been out here with a small curve to the left, and it's not until after landing that she then would have been able to switch leads and prepare for the turn. So crosses on the flat, in general are going to be later information for the dog and cost you a little bit in yardage. Where here she was already on the correct lead and she took off, I would have had to wait for her to land 
and then been able to cue the turn, which is going to be extra strides and yardage. So my general rule of thumb is when possible, always try to do the cross at the obstacle. And that's going to be true of both rear crosses and front crosses. It's only if I don't have another choice that I will choose to do a cross on the flat. I also might choose to do crosses on the flat a bit more for a young dog in order to provide more supportive cues at the jump. So you can see that if I had gone to the landing side of nine, it would have been a lot more supportive cues at the jump. So through number nine. So that might have been a little bit better for a young dog who I'm looking to build confidence on. Wonderful. I think that that gets us through all of the questions. Uh, so you can go ahead and stop sharing your video. And we're back here. And now uh, if someone had some video to look at also from Westminster. Mm -hmm. So why don't you tell us a bit about what we're about to see? Well, it's interesting because when Jen and I were planning this, I also thought of the exact same run and I wanted to do the same Westminster video where I was running Gitchy. It's a good video to show everyone tonight because uh, we did not qualify on that course. Mistakes were made, things went wrong. And so it's a really uh, good one to show you and actually have a little bit of follow up from last night's uh, Facebook Live. So as soon as we get that up, uh, we'll take a closer look. Uh, I definitely want to second what Jennifer was telling you about blind crosses, because um, they definitely are going to be easier, especially for handlers who are dealing with, uh, you know, kind of joint muscle type stuff. Um, after I had surgery on my toe, certainly, I noted that it was much easier to do blind crosses uh, when given the opportunity where you would normally do some front crosses. So I think there's uh, definitely a lot of truth there. Uh, is it ready to go now? It looks like it. Okay, so as you can see, we are looking at the exact same jumpers run, the infamous jumpers run with wait, a really hold on, low. Just a second. Oh, wait, it's just falling behind. That's all. Okay, you're good to go. <laughs> okay, uh, the jumpers run with the really low Q rate here and the really tough segment uh, that Jen beautifully explained and got both of her dogs through. I unfortunately did not get my dog through it. Uh, let me first start off by saying that. In the game of agility, you've got 20, 21 obstacles, however many obstacles you're running. Ideally, what is the best way to get your dog through this course, say if you had magical Harry Potter-like powers? You would magically appear next to the very next obstacle. So if you sat your dog in front of obstacle one, you would stand right by the wing of jump number one. And then as your dog was taking jump number one, you would magically appear next to whichever side of obstacle number two they needed to go to and make a turn. And then you would vanish and appear at three and four and five. And your dog could literally follow you from obstacle to obstacle. They would have to quickly locate you, right? Maybe you're going to pop up on the left or the right or behind them or wherever. But as soon as they found you, they'd, they'd be able to go to that obstacle. And so obviously you don't have that magical teleportation ability. And so you've got to run there. And that's where course design matters. And that's where the judges are trying to uh, affect the decisions that you make for you and your dog. If you can't be there ahead of your dog, then you no longer have the option between front cross and blind cross. Now you've got to throw in some rear crosses. And I think a lot of people understand that as they fall behind, there are going to be situations where you're going to have to do some rear crosses. And if you do one, then you often have to do the second, just like the situation that uh, Pink and Jennifer were in. You know, she does the first rear and now she's got to do the second rear cross. Um, but what about when uh, there's really no advantage uh, one versus the other? So I'm going to get over here to the same spot. We're coming after the weeds, and we're looking, and that's number four, and we're going to go to the number five turn. At Westminster, I opted for the front cross here to get down this line. And you can see I'm going to show the front cross and then take off down this line. One thing I could have done, instead of doing the front cross here, instead of coming here and doing the front cross, I could have just stopped right here, stop right here, and let her drive around and pass me this way and take the jump. And then I could have rear crossed her and also run down the line in this direction. Um, because the dog is in the weed poles and I can get to whatever spot I want to get to, either one is a reasonable choice. You can front, you can rear, you can blind if you want. The net effect of a blind is just to put you in the same position as the front. And then end up running down the line. In fact, I would say just by checking my position here, this is where I ended up on the front. Uh, on a rear cross, I probably would have been a little bit more like over here. 
And in my mind, that's a little bit closer to the line that I want to run. So here I probably had to come around this way. From here, it's a, a shorter path. So the rear cross may have been even more favorable there. And this assumes that the dog is going to run with the same speed from the weaves over that jump and down the line. Right, so as long as your dog runs full speed there with either the rear or the front, you're okay to do either one. But the rear maybe gives me a little less yardage. So why didn't I do that one? Well, I made this decision here at Westminster, like most people, most of us make our decisions about what cross to use. It's what can my dog do? Or what can my dog do in this situation? And for me, I know that uh, Gitchi has probably never refused this kind of front cross, but she has on occasion, um, <clears throat> refused a rear cross in this situation. This green jump here is angling away from the dog a little bit. And so you gotta make sure that you drive the dog to this jump. And in fact, I saw several handlers in front of me trying to get this head start on their dog that they're pulling away so strongly that the dog actually refused to take jump number five. And these are, you know, pretty quality dogs. And um, it's not something that I wanted to risk. So in that spot, even though I could have done any of the three, front, blind, or rear, I opted to go with the front cross. So that was my decision making uh, there for that specific case. All right, so now I go ahead and get down the line here. I'm gonna zoom back out, get to the other side of the broad. And now I'm actually gonna take you to last night because as Jen already showed you quite beautifully, your dog is supposed to take this red jump, not take the tunnel, and then go on to the jump that's over here. And let's take a look at what Gitchi does here. That's right, she's right in the tunnel, she's off course, and our run is over. Um, so what happened there, we're gonna go back to this idea of uh, when you set your lines. And remember what I said last night, freeze your video when your dog's front feet are in the air. So here her front feet are in the air, right? And Gitchi is approaching at approximately an angle like this. And when we take a look at what the handler is doing, we have a couple of interesting things. One, my new direction should be this way because that's where the jump is. But instead, I'm still very much going this way. So the dog is going to parallel your path and that's going to take her straight to the tunnel. Um, so there's the turn. Now look. I'm facing that direction, I'm moving in that direction, but it's far too late, the dog is already landed. So this would be a really amazing call off. At this point, she's probably just a yard, yard and a half away from the tunnel. Um, and so she's not gonna do it. It's just one more stride right into the tunnel. So you can see here that this turn is late. I'm driving the dog in the wrong direction. We're gonna put her straight into the tunnel. At the time that I ran this, I felt like I handled it fine. As soon as I saw the video, I knew right away that we had an issue. Um, so a lot of times when you're reviewing your own video, you're gonna run into this, you're gonna think you did the right thing, you're gonna maybe be a little annoyed with your dog, only to review the video and find out that uh, you messed up the handling. And so again, freeze when the dog's taking off, take a look at where, where you are, the direction that you're headed, and what your dog thinks they should do based on your motion and position. And here it's pretty clear that I want her to take the tunnel. So I wanted to go over that mistake with you uh, and then move on to the next part of the course. So I get her back, we get her in the tunnel. And uh, one point that I wanted to make was rear crosses are great. A lot of you who follow me pretty closely know that I use them a lot, probably more on average than other similar handlers. Okay, I'll probably do some more rears than other people. Uh, so I really like them. But one place the rear crosses are really weak is if you have to rear cross and the dog has more than one option after that rear cross. Okay, you can do all kinds of rear crosses. Uh, slight angle rear cross where they can jump an extension. You can do a tight wrap rear cross. Like I chose not to do a jump number five here um, this time, but I could have easily then. You can do those kinds of rear crosses when it's pretty clear where the dog needs to go after. But when there's multiple choices and you are behind the dog and the dog cannot see you very well, it turns into a management issue. That's where you're gonna get some stride checking, you're gonna get some loss of speed, you're gonna get more off courses and rear crosses become riskier. And it's all about position. Going back to our teleportation thought experiment, you wanna magically appear by the, by the next obstacle. 
So we have this situation here. What happened was, once we made the mistake here, I also, like Jen and just about everybody who ran this at Westminster, wanted to come into this box for a front cross. Jen showed you with a front and with a blind. I wanted to go for the front here. But we had already made the mistake. I felt like she was approaching the takeoff zone, and I was not downstream as far as I had walked. So I was like, you know what? I'm just going to throw in a rear cross and do it with a rear cross for practice. Like, literally, I'm, I'm just going to change my plan in the middle here. And so I opted for a rear. Uh, so not great handling here, but it's a great demonstration for the weakness of the rear cross in this situation. And you can see that as Gitchy comes over this jump here, she's coming this way. I'm cutting behind her, so the rear cross is well executed. But look at this rear cross compared to both of Jennifer's dogs. I'll run it through here. You should have noticed how incredibly wide this turn is. And it's wide because she thought about getting into the weeds. In fact, I think she's headed to the weed poles right here. So was she wrong to head into the weed poles here? Based on my handling, no, because the rear cross just tells you to turn. And it tells you which way to turn. In this case, turn right. So rear cross, turn right. I'm crossing behind her here. But now, there are, there's not one, not two, but there are three options for the dog. Number one is the weave poles. That's a turn, it's not a straight line. If she took a straight line, she would just run right out of the ring in this direction. All right, she would not head for the weaves. Uh, the weaves are a turn. The dog has to turn to get to the weaves, and that's what I've cued her to do. Number two, let's say the weaves poles weren't there then it would be a 270 or to the back side of the next jump, which is yellow. Let me go ahead and run it through a little bit. So this is the correct jump. So let's say there's no weave poles. That's option number two to this back side. But there's a third option as well. As the dog comes in here, they could even come in and throttle that. Yes, normally they would need to do that with a threat alarm. But if I were to use the rear cross, as I would have wanted to in the opening, where I wanted that tight wrap rear cross at number five. If I had a nice tight wrap rear cross, there's a risk here that as the dog approaches this next jump, they take it the wrong way, the throttle way instead of the 270 or backside way. So three options here, the rear cross does not control it very well. And I'm fortunate that my dog didn't go for this off course or actually take the off course, I should say, because she definitely went for the off course. And so I got caught here. So in my opinion, a rear cross here is a really bad move. It's not ideal. You definitely want to do the front, the blind, get to the other side. Because when you can do that, so if I had been able to do my plan, I'd be somewhere between these two obstacles. And then it's much more clear, especially when I throw on the brakes, combine it with a little bit of deceleration there, that um, the jump is next, not the weave poles. And if I felt like the dog was going to come in the gap and throttle, it'd be easy to take just one step to the wing and get them to the correct side of that obstacle. So I just want to show you the weakness of the rear cross there from someone who uses lots of rear crosses um, in his handling. All right, now, Sarah, I want to move it to the standard run. Okay. Okay, so the standard run, let me back up here. Um, the opening was very interesting, and there were a lot of problems with the opening. And so the big deal here is to turn from two to three, uh, and then four, and then you're coming to the weave poles. And so I really wanted to, uh, you know, do well in this round, and so I wanted really good turns everywhere. I got a beautiful turn here, and I got it by staying on the takeoff side. So I think one of the things um, Jen talks about is – uh, if you ever hear uh, Jen talking about this kind of stuff, when you're kind of on this takeoff side over here, you're able to get the dog a little bit tighter. If you're doing stuff on the landing side, let's say I came in and did a front cross here, which a lot of people did, the dogs are going to extend, they're going to tend to extend, and you're going to get some really wide turns. A lot of dogs even went almost to the teeter. Um, so a lot of wide turns for handlers who came in here, did a front cross, in order to maneuver over the triple which is coming up. And so I saw those handlers and I said, I don't want that wide turn. I'm gonna stay over here on this side, use my deceleration, stand over here, use my deceleration. So here I'm coming to a dead stop, dead stop. So dog knows, put in your extra stride, come get your tight turn, okay? 
And then here at number three, it does not make sense to come in and try and front cross for a side change. I think a blind cross would have been reasonable. And in retrospect, I think if I had come in here and done a blind, I would have liked that a little better. But it was a panel jump. Uh, Gitchy tends to drop these at a pretty high rate. Uh, so at the time, I just went for the rear cross. And so one of the reasons that I chose to do a rear cross at the, at the next obstacle rather than a blind cross or front cross in here is because I did not want to be in the dog's landing space, right? And if I'm going to rear the next part, then it doesn't matter here. I can run this line and then all this space is hers for her to land and keep the panel up. If I come in here and I try this, sorry, let me make this screen. If I come in here and I try to front cross to get a side change or blind cross, I'm worried about the panel. And so that's, that's your next pro tip here. If you have a bar knocker, and I'm talking about um, the dog that drops a bar, at least one bar, almost every round, all right? Or at least half the time, where it's, a, where it's a problem, and you know it's a problem. Rear crosses tend to give your dog a little more space and a little more heads up than front crosses uh, or blind crosses. So they're gonna be a little bit uh, riskier. So that may be a factor in choosing uh, one cross or not using another cross. So here I go ahead and set up for a very nice rear cross. It's pretty well executed. I'm crossing behind here, so she knows she's got a turn coming up, and she knows before the takeoff. Uh, we know she knows because she's hugging this part of the wing. She's not jumping straight and then turning after she lands. So a lot of dogs took this straight because handlers are very reluctant to do uh, rear crosses here very well. So if they were rear crossing, they kind of went this way and then cut after the dog lands. So their dog goes straight and then gets a really wide turn. And we had a couple of missed entries because of that. So Gitchy knows the turn is coming and she does very well. But maybe those handlers have the last laugh because if you see here, we get the bar down on the slice. And so you'll hear things uh, uh, from instructors, from other competitors, never rear cross on a double, a triple, a broad jump, a spread jump, whatever you call it, um, because you're gonna run into these kind of issues. It depends on the situation, but it's just something that you need to keep in mind. So as something as basic as the opening, you know, there's only so many different ways you can handle the opening, but every handler is going to think about it differently. And you need to think about it differently based on the size of your dog, the stride of your dog, uh, whether your dog is a bar knocker. Uh, if you have uh, the ability to lead out to jump number two, some of you have to do running starts with your dogs. Your dog doesn't have a start line. So you're going to have to really strengthen your rear crossing. So all of those things come into play. All right, and there's just one more spot I want you to look at, and that's in the weave pulls here. There's plenty of opportunity to get ahead. And in order to create this turn to the teeter, I could have done the same thing as the opening, which is just stop here on the takeoff side, get a tight turn. And then as she gets on the teeter, I can just go ahead and rear cross the teeter. Um, here I opt for the front cross. Uh, the timing, I think, is, is just like what you saw with Jen here. We've got the right arm here committing the dog to the obstacle. The dog is moving into the takeoff zone. Front feet are not yet up in the air, and I'm already moving through the front cross. By the time I land, I've already taken my first step in that direction, and so the dog knows immediately it's not this off course, it's not the table off course, they're going to the teeter, we get a really good turn here and get up on the teeter. So why, if I could do a front cross or a rear cross, why choose the front cross here? Uh, when I did the exact opposite in the opening, and the consideration here is how fast the dog is going to take the teeter. If I'm running ahead of my dog as they take the teeter and I'm running over here ahead or even with my dog, the dog is going to take it as fast as possible. I know that about my dog. Ideally, all of us should be able to turn here, stop here, send our dog onto the teeter, and they, they should run the same time, whether we go with them or not. But for 99% of dogs, that's not the case. My dog's not an exception there. They're not in the 1%. My dog is gonna run the teeter a little bit faster, two or three tenths of a second faster if I run with her. And so with the rear cross, you can't do that. You have to wait, let them pass you, and then you're cutting behind them. So you are trailing the dog. And so that's the reason I went for that here, to drive and get a little bit of uh, more speed for that particular uh, performance. All right, well, that's all I wanted to show you here on this one. 
All right, we do have a couple of questions. Um, let's start with this course since we're still here. Oh, okay. um, so uh, Jennifer actually commented that in the opening, she went to the landing side of jump two and she got a really wide turn with pink. Oh, so okay. She's su okay. supporting what you were talking about in terms of the decision I'm trying, making. Yeah, I'm trying to remember because I know I definitely watched, um, I think I watched every single one of Jen's uh, runs with all of the dogs she had. And um, I, if I saw her run before my run, then that definitely influenced me being on that takeoff side of two. Of course, you know, ultimately I paid the price by rearing on the triple and taking the bar. That bar was our only fault on that run. I think that would have been a third place run, you know, um, behind, I think, um, Fame and uh, Sarah Baker and Hawk. So, you know, that was a pretty good run. Um, but yeah, that's an interesting note. I'm glad Jen uh, pointed that out. And another question was on the opening was um, the question was technically isn't it a serp there is over the rod uh, over the so like a serp into oh a like over the panel yeah panel sorry. oh panel, yeah, panel. yeah 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 so it, it it depends on the angle that your dog takes I think for Gitchy let's take a look let's see if you're right here so I'm gonna drop I need a straight line here so okay so she's slicing kind of in this direction. Uh, yeah, I think I think you can make that case. It is the slightest of serps. There's the slightest bit of line change. Very, very subtle. So a good eye for whoever cut that. Obviously, if Gitchi had gone, let's say she had done this route instead of this slicey route. So she does the big route. So if you do that big route, then you have a big turn here, and then it's very easy to see that that's a serpentine. So I would say yes possibly a very subtle serpentine. And then some of the other questions were about um, the tunnel mistake in the previous run. Sure. And um, we have uh, questions about possibly using a flappy tappy in that spot or some other handling options. Yes, oh, okay. Um, reverse spin, no, I do not like the reverse spin there. Um, the reverse spin, they may be able to stay out of the tunnel, but they're still gonna go super wide. They're basically gonna run right up to the tunnel. Uh, let me go ahead and go back to that video while uh, while we do that. Um, yes. So if you take a look here, and, and here is a, a great example because Gitchy's extending here. So you can see where Gitchy lands, right? If Gitchy collects, she's not going to land there. She's going to land, I don't know, maybe about there, right? Maybe a foot and a half back and a foot and a half closer to this wing over here, right? on some kind of collected stride. She's getting ready to turn. She's on a different line. So a reverse spin is basically going to, in, in my view, going to give you the discrimination. Yes, might take you off the tunnel, or should take you off the tunnel. Uh, so you, you will, quote unquote, get it. You know, your dog's going to get it right, but the turn's going to be really wide there. Um, and so I don't like the reverse spin there. I'd rather the dog turn tighter and know where they're going before takeoff. Uh, at that weight. And then someone mentioned, yes, yeah, so we had several people uh, mention a spin. And I think it's worth noting that uh, Jessica Zhu, of course, and Famous, who won, and they are, uh, she's a one, one mind, uh, one mind dogs instructor. I think they opted to be rearing through there. So just so you know, Jessica Bone D. Coach did not want to roll through there with a reverse spin. Not that there weren't people who did a reverse spin and were not successful. I'm just telling you what the high-end people did there in that spot. But that's a really good question. Uh, would someone ask if D cell would have worked? Oh no, I flappy tappy. Yeah, okay. Flappy tappy, yeah. flappy tappy. So flappy tappy is the same thing. It's basically the same thing. And those are basically stay with me. Don't take that tunnel. I think possibly it could have worked if I had thought to do it. But you're running into the same problem. The dog is already on this line. Right, so I'm going to favor a maneuver like um, that, that's going to create, that's going to give Gitchy knowledge of a turn coming before the takeoff. And the problem with the flappy tappy in this spot is the same, in my opinion, as the reverse spin. It's kind of a reactive. Yeah, yeah. The dog's going to the tunnel, and then you're going to tell him, like, okay, well, you know, don't take that tunnel. And they know, they'll be like, okay, I'm not going to take the tunnel. But, Mr. or Miss Handler, I've already taken off the ground. So I will come to you. I know I'm not going to take the tunnel, but this turn is not going to be a nice tight one. It's not going to be a great line in here. 
All right, I think we have a question that um, I think we could get an answer from you and Jen, and I've got my own uh, answer for it as well. Okay, so you're going to get us both back up on the screen now that we're done with the coaching Yes, class. we will stop sharing and start our video. Okay, uh, and so, oh, and Jen's back too. Yay, the gang's all here. Uh, so the question is from Anne. She says, when you walk a course, do you walk a plan B in case you can't get far, ahead, uh, far enough ahead for a blind cross? And this was dur during uh, your presentation, Jen, so I'll let you start with your answer. Yeah, I saw that question come through uh, after I was done. And I think definitely that is going to be the case with my younger dogs or the dogs that I'm a newer team with. Um, the ones where I maybe can't 100% predict where I'm going to be relative to them. With my more seasoned dogs, um, you know, Lucky's going on six years old. We've been running together as a team. By now, I can pretty much accurately predict where we're going to be. Um, it doesn't mean I'm not always going to walk a plan B, but I can pretty much walk a course and say with him, yes, I'm going to make it there. No, I'm not going to make it there. Um, or have a pretty good idea. There are going to be the times when I'm unsure, and absolutely, I'm going to walk it both ways. I'm going to walk with the front, and I'm going to walk with the blind, or I'm going to walk with the front, and I'm going to walk with the rear. Um, but it happens a lot more with the younger dogs. I'm just debuting a dog, or we're still coming up the ranks and open or excellent, and we haven't quite figured each other out. Um, then I will definitely walk a couple plans and say, okay, what are they going to be running like? Where am I going to get relative to them? So it is not uncommon at all for me to walk a couple different plans and decide based on where I am relative to them. All right, Esteban, plan, plan B. Do you ever walk plan Bs? Definitely. And sometimes I'll run a C, B, and E, uh, AKC Nationals this past year for sure. I ran basically every option. Uh, or I walked every option and I had it all in my head and then the actual path that I ran I never walked that through from start to finish even once in the practice. Yeah, I was so about I took, to call I took, you like, out. <laughs> I took a mishmash of all the different things. Right. Right. So I walked it. I had walked each individual maneuver that I did but I didn't um, I never put it all together and actually the opening no I never did. I, never, right. I ended up going the completely different way. I think that's what you can do when you're experienced and you have a lot of good um, uh, you know, visualization skills, like your mental game is really strong. You got a lot of experience there. You can do stuff like that. So me and Jen, we've been around for a while. Uh, and we're almost always advising newcomers not to do that, right? We're telling the beginners, oh, you know, don't pick two or three things. Pick one thing and stick with it. So you may be getting that advice. And now you're hearing, oh, wait, Jen and Estella, they got all these plans and backup plans and this and that. And he's inventing things on the fly in the finals. It's a little bit different. So for the most part, you want to be listening to that advice. You have one plan and kind of stick to it as your dog goes along. Um, you're going to get better at predicting what they're going to do. Um, the one interesting point here is for those of you who have the Jekyll and Hyde dogs, right? Sometimes your dog runs fast. Sometimes your dog runs a little bit slower. Sometimes they'll go fast and slow on the same run, right? So you, you know, you plan with rear crosses and then suddenly they, you know, they're running, uh, uh, they get that burst of energy. No, in this case, they're running slower and then okay. you're like, oh, I couldn't have the front right, or, or right, vice versa. Right, but, right. you know, you understand what I'm saying. So that, that's a much more difficult situation. And so those handlers, I think, tend to do uh, more plan A, plan B. But definitely I do it, but usually it's just in one particular spot. Right. Yeah. I think I do typically, um, if there are two, you know, equally good options like front versus rear. I do like to walk them just once, just to feel it, uh, just in case something happens. I mean, especially like you may not think you're gonna do a rear cross, but you could trip on the course and end up putting in a rear cross that you didn't plan to. But my biggest advice that I always give people when it comes to plan A, plan B, plan C is, it's fine to have a plan B, but it is not fine to have two plan A's. You do not go out there and walk both things and not have decided when you get to the line what you're doing. You have to commit because those handlers uh, end up in this in-between space. They're not far enough ahead for the front. They do a rear, but they're actually out of position for the rear. They're too far ahead for the rear. Rears actually have to be mm -hmm. set up well in advance. So um, A and B, totally fine. A and A, nope, that's, <laughs> that's a no-go. Uh, so that's our advice there. Um, let's see, the other question that we have here that's kind of a general question is, um, say you need to execute, this is from Peter, say you need to execute either a front cross or a blind cross between two consecutive bar jumps, 
Does the spacing of the two jumps influence your choice of which cross to use? It seems like a blind cross requires less space and is much smoother. So Jen, what do you think about um, that? Uh, yes, absolutely. I think uh, the distance would affect. Um, I, I think, you know, the scenario I'm in visualizing is kind of more of an artificial, okay, let me go in the backyard and set up two jumps versus a course. But even away from the dog is going to be a forward cue. So you're going to have much less control on whether the dog does or doesn't add a stride when you're doing a blind. Um, I have had distances on courses where I can look at that and say, okay, my dog is going to want to only do it in one stride, but I can also look at it and say, if they only do it in one stride, they're going to hit the bar. You know, my 16 inch Sheltie isn't going to clear that 23 foot gap in one stride. So what I may do knowing that he would want to only do it in one stride with the blind is I may choose to do the front and add the rotation towards them, add the turning cues and force the added stride. So you're gonna get, uh, in my mind, a little bit more control over the striding um, with the front and what you can add in, where with the blind cross, I think it's harder to do so. Um, I can't say that on an every weekend basis, I make the decision of front versus blind on the distance alone, but it absolutely could be a factor that I would take into account. You guys are still on mute. Thank you. Uh, just looking at these additional questions. And um, one thing that I'll add on the uh, what you were talking about, about the, the dogs tending to uh, have a lot of forward cues coming out of blinds. I think dogs have a lot of forward cues coming out of fronts too, because I think that most handlers do fronts between two jumps where they're going to continue to run and they just don't practice a front and then an immediate decel. And it's the same front or blind your dog needs exposure to, uh, now I've switched sides, but now what comes next is an immediate decel, add strides, you know, possibly a wrap. And uh, that, it just comes down to giving them that experience, I think. Um, the other question, uh, oh, here is Lois. <laughs> she said she learned that it's not a good idea to rear across the tunnel. What are your feelings on this and why? And I'll start off by saying that, um, I think rear crossing the tunnel is more difficult than other obstacles, and uh, but I don't think that I um, but I wouldn't shy away from it. It's something that I would train. But the the main thing that you have to realize when you're rear crossing a tunnel is that the dog loses their sight of you so much earlier than they do with a jump, and so you have to put really strong pressure on the dog before they even get into the tunnel at all because as soon as their nose is in the tunnel they can't they can't see or feel that pressure anymore so that's why it's such an advanced move because the dog has to be able to accept pressure early and not push off the tunnel anything to add on that no i basically agree it's tough they often turn the wrong way and that's why you're going to get that warning from instructors don't do it and uh, yeah, they need some kind of information. You can try getting to the other side and yelling. I highly recommend it, right? If you're gonna do a rear cross and you're immediately gonna be on the correct side, if you're calling them, in their mind, they may be thinking, well, I last saw them over here, but I hear the voice coming from over here. Hopefully they're gonna turn in that direction. So you know, that's one adjustment I would make. Definitely when they're in the tunnel, that might be the one time on course where you're gonna yell and panic and blah, 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 and, you know. I won't think you're crazy. Um, and uh, yeah, but it's that, it's that lack of vision. So We actually went out in the field one time and uh, sat down at the exit of the tunnel with my eyes closed and I had handlers walk behind. I had a sub on walk behind and say my name periodically. It's, it's like the hearing test. I was like, you're on this side, you're on this side, you're on this side, you're on this side, you're on this side. And I could 100% tell which side he was on based on where the sound was coming from. So I, I think it is a really helpful cue to use that. And I think a lot of handlers, they call their dog when they see their dog. And that's, you know, that's too late. The dog's already out and they've already committed to one direction or the other. Right. So that's why I'm always saying call the dog while they are still in the tunnel, while they still have time to do something about it on exit. Anything, uh, any additional thoughts there, Jen? Nope, I, I agree with everything you said. I'm not going to shy away from rear crossing a tunnel. I'm definitely going to practice it and train it, but uh, 
tunnels are unique in that they are an, an obstacle that forces the dog to be on a particular lead. So if it's a curve to the right, the dog needs to perform on the right lead. If it's a curve to the left, they have to perform it on their left lead. It's not like a jump where the dog could be on either lead or a contact where the dog could be on either lead. So I think where people struggle or potentially a struggle or for the dog would be if you're late on your rear and they go into the tunnel, let's say the curve of the tunnel is going to the right, but they don't read the rear. So they go into the tunnel on the left lead and then they kind of hit that side of the wall or they don't make the late lead change. We see a lot of those novice dogs turn around and come back out or get confused going, you know, hey, mom's on my left, uh, but the tunnel's turning right. And that goes right back to you have to be early. You have, if they start seeing the pressure or feeling the pressure before they go in and they can start making the lead change before they go in, then they can get onto the correct lead. And then the curve of the tunnel is then consistent with the lead that the handler put them on. So I think dogs are much happier to say, oh, we're turning right on, and I'm already on my right lead versus that late rear cross. So definitely a skill I'll do, one I want to practice and make sure I'm very timely on. Yeah, that's a really good point. On a curved tunnel, uh, you know, I'll step back and say no. On a curved tunnel there, yeah, in general, I do not want to be uh, rear crossing. Um, yeah, I'm going to do some kind I'm going to pick them up at the, at the, the uh, finish of the tunnel and then pick them up and blind or rear the next part or something like that. Or on the entry, I'm going to make sure I have to do whatever it takes to be on the other side. Um, you know, when they asked, when you asked the question, I was more envisioning like a straight tunnel, but like the classic straight tunnel and you shoot a man and you're trying to rear across a straight tunnel, but just right when it's hooked like that, I mean, yeah, that, that's a tough spot. So, yep. you know, if that's what, uh, I think it was Lois, if that's what she's talking about, then yeah, I think that's definitely a really tough spot there. And I think that's why in international courses, they use a lot of tunnels, a lot of straight tunnels. A lot of times you're going to be forced, uh, to, to be in situations where a rear cross before the tunnel would be great and people avoid it like a plague for that exact uh, reason. I think it just takes a little bit more training. So unless you're comfortable with it, you're definitely going to get an edge. So I think it's um, worth doing. Straight tunnels is one of those things that scares people off. Uh, this is a way you can out-train your younger, faster, taller opponents. I'm telling you right now, um, especially all you ladies out there, you know, you can really, uh, show up this, uh, I don't know, 30 something year old Italian six foot guy with the <laughs> sling back hair. And you're going to, you're going to beat him with your dog because you have the ability to rear across a straight tunnel on that course. Perfect. Uh, and then, uh, Michelle Reed asked, um, something about, uh, she heard that the dogs can't hear you in the tunnel. Uh, I guess I didn't go into the tunnel, but I guess I, I, I think that they can, uh, and I handle as if they can, and I'm going to start calling them early. I'm going to keep calling them as they come uh, out, I mean, but I'm going to call yeah. them early. Uh, it's definitely not going to hurt. Uh, so, okay. Yeah, go ahead. So, so this is a physics problem. Um, so this is like a real science. <laughs> so there's a tunnel, uh, sound waves, and they bounce around and stuff. So it's true that your dog will have a much more difficult time locating where you are because of the tunnels. Like if you're, if you have ever been in a tunnel, a cave or a hallway and someone calls you, it's more difficult, right? Because now sounds that are coming from the right can also hit you from the other direction and things like that, right? Slight sounds are also different in the ocean, right? It's all how waves are traveling and they're bouncing all over this tunnel as opposed to being in the open space, right? Where no sound is approaching your left ear kind of from that way. Um, so your instructor's right in it if they say it's more difficult than if that tunnel wasn't there, okay? Or if you had some kind of magical mesh tunnel, right, that was not solid, right? Right, your sound waves could just go right through the mesh, like it was made out of, I don't know, mesh, right? Some kind of <laughs> soft mesh, soft mesh tunnel, right? It wouldn't be a problem. The hearing would be basically the same, right? Right, but it's not, it's enclosed, so it's more difficult but it is not impossible. So it's incorrect for your instructor to say, they can't hear you, they can't figure it out. That's just not true. And so I, and truth I, is somewhere in between. Right, somewhere in between, and I definitely um, see better connection with my dog coming out of tunnels when I give him that auditory information before I can give him any physical information because he's not out yet and he can't see me. Yep. So, yep. Um, and then, uh, let's see, Barbara asked, she, she mentioned, uh, and this is a perfect segue, she mentioned the analysis that Estelan did on the winning run that Lisa Frick and Haas had, I, I believe that's on our website from, gosh, like five years ago. Oh, wow, yeah. And she asked Haas is retired now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she asked if we'd be doing more than these. And uh, so it's a great opportunity for us to tell you that the 
if you got the email about tonight's live, you saw at the bottom that the VIP program is open for new members now. Um, and yeah, as so part I, of, oh, sorry, go uh, ahead. <laughs> well, since I have to do most of the analyses. Um, uh, Barbara, yeah, every month we look at all the biggest runs from all around the world. We cover um, Crufts, the World Championship, European Open, Westminster Finals. We're looking at all kinds of things. WAO, um, Jennifer was doing stuff with her, uh, you know, winning uh, Snickers run. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're, we're looking at all the best handlers from all around the world. Every month, the VIP members get a look at that analysis, and we also do uh, course maps as well. On the course map side, we'll even go the other direction and break down novice and open course maps for the beginners, so they can learn from that as well. So to answer your question, Barbara, we're still doing that, but we're doing it with, with, within the VIP membership. Mostly. Yeah. And we have the occasional run on our website, but most of that is in the VIP. And uh, for anybody who's interested in that, um, you can go to baddogagility.com slash VIP or in the comments, if you're watching this on Facebook, if you type VIP, you should get a Facebook message with more details. But we're really excited this year because we are also adding Jennifer Crank uh, as an instructor to the VIP program. So everything that you saw today, um, she's bringing that, uh, you know, that great knowledge to our VIP participants and doing um, course map analyses, course run analyses, demonstrations, and feedback for uh, our members. So we're really excited that she's joining us. Yeah, it's, it's going to be super fun. I'm really excited to branch out and do this because, I mean, teaching's fun. Teaching's awesome. Getting the information out there, um, you know, providing everybody with the opportunity to learn. But the problem with teaching live is you are limited. If you're doing a private lesson in one hour, you can only help one person. In a class, you might have six students in an hour, and that's it. And even seminars uh, get tricky. I don't do as many anymore because you got to show your dogs. But the awesome opportunity with the VIP is that I can, I can do it all. I can show on the weekend and then come home and go online and do run analysis, uh, help people answer questions, you know, submit uh, uh, articles or videos of my own dogs and be able to access uh, and reach out to more people. And the reverse is true as a student. I mean, the thing about the VIP is – what if you're a early bird person, you want to get up and you want to get training in the morning, but your local club only has evening classes or the reverse. You want to sleep in, but the instructor you're working with only teaches in the morning, like me, starting at 7 a.m. The VIP is 24-7. It's online. You can go on. You can wake up at 6.30 in the morning and go start uh, submitting videos to review, or you can read articles, or you can review Esteban and his analysis of Haas. Um, it's there all the time. So the opportunity for me to reach more people and teach with a more um, flexible schedule and reach more people is there, but also as a student, you are not within the constraints of your instructor or waiting for the next front cross seminar to come into town. You can get on and find some articles or submit some videos and get some feedback right away. So it's just, uh, I'm very excited for the opportunity to get to do this. And we are bringing Jennifer Crank to the entire world. <laughs> Anybody anywhere in the world can train with Estelle and Jennifer and myself uh, all year long. So. Yeah. It's a big driving force because I remember going to seminars that, you know, you think are really good, you get a lot out of it, and then it's awkward. Like, you have a question, one month later, you see something at a trial, what are you going to do, right? You need to wait a year later for that seminar presenter to come back to your area, and I think that's one of the, uh, one of the reasons that we kind of put this together and make ourselves accessible, so we have a lot of that, you know, people getting in touch with us. All right. Well, I think we have hit um, all of the questions. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. Excellent. And thank you, Estelle. Thanks, and Jen. Absolutely. All right. We will see everybody online. And happy training. <laughs>